Good afternoon or good evening. Thank you all for joining us today. We are super excited to host another one of the ecosystem-based fishery management seminars. Uh, I, my name is Katie. I am the NOAA Central Librarian who is going to be hosting this today. If you are having any issues with GoToWebinar, please try logging off and logging back in. That solves most issues. Uh, please note that you are muted. If you have any questions, uh, either for myself or for the speaker, please place those in the question or the chat panels. All questions for the speaker will be asked at the end in a Q&A session. If there's a technical question, I will be answering those um, online. Just so you know, we are recording this seminar, so if you have to hop off at any point, or if you would like to share this with a colleague, it will be uh, posted later uh, to our the library's YouTube channel, which I will share uh, in the chat shortly. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Peg Brady to introduce our speaker today. Thank you so much, Katie. Uh, yes, this is Peg Brady from NOAA Fisheries. Uh, today, we're continuing our 2021 NOAA ecosystem-based management seminar series uh, that we initiated, our team initi initiated back in November 2017. Our main objectives for the series is to showcase the excellent projects that are being implemented by NOAA and our partners, and we do have a wonderful partner joining us today to advance EBM and to increase awareness regarding EBM and its implementation and highlight certain initiatives around the country and around the world. Um, and today, uh, thanks to uh, Noah Library, who has been our co-host since the beginning, uh, the seminar is held on the second Wednesday of each month at three o'clock uh, on the Eastern time in the United States. Each presentation is publicly accessible, as Katie just mentioned, and she'll share the link with you where you can reach and get the archive uh, seminars from the past and also pass along Mark's presentation today. Following today's presentation, uh, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions, as uh, Katie outlined earlier, and uh, we'll address those questions uh, with the speaker uh, after his presentation. And I want to thank many of our speakers that we've had in the past, as well as all those attendees who have been joining us routinely each month. Before I begin, I'd like to um, share information about our next speaker, uh, just a little uh, commercial break. On June 9th, Dr. Mike Russ, from our science advisor for from the NOAA Fisheries Aquaculture Program will speak about marine aquaculture, an example of ecosystem-based management. Today, we're very pleased and very fortunate to have Dr. Mark Dickey Collis speak to us. Mark is the chair of the International Council for Exploration of the Seas Advisory Committee, and he's joining us today from Copenhagen um, in Denmark. So thanks to, thanks to Mark for staying up late over there uh, and joining us to see the this afternoon here in the U.S. Uh, Mark's been uh, working in the area of uh, ecosystem marine fisheries uh, for 25 years, has experience uh, it with providing advice in Northern Ireland and the Netherlands. Uh, Mark liaises with regional and international or organizations across the North Atlantic and the Arctic. And so we're very, very excited to have Mark uh, share his uh, understanding of EBM and some of his uh, observations. And uh, again, Again, thanks to Mark and to our um, attendees. Thank you very much. And I'll just turn it over to Mark. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peg. Thank you very much for all of you listening in and watching. Uh, I hope that you enjoy what I'm about to say. I'm going to talk about uh, EBFM compliant knowledge providers. Time to think about the how in addition to the what. So, what I'm really going to focus on is the role of scientists in the EBFM process. I'm going to do that first by giving you a few thoughts of my recent experience about the EBM principles and challenges. Then I'm going to turn towards three attributes, credibility, legitimacy, and salience, and then I will wrap up. I want to make it clear, I'm going to say absolutely nothing new. It's heavily based around the cash paper, which many of you will know, credibility, legitimacy, and saliency. And um, it's more of a synthesis, and as Peg said, a collection of my observations. So also, I'm probably going to 
steal from many of your works and so uh, take it as uh, a compliment that I'm quoting your work or using your images. So EBM, where do we stand? Uh, we, I put this slide in to take us back to the beginning, to the Brundtland Report, 1987, UNCLOS and the Rio Declaration, which led to the Convention on Biological Diversity, Malawi Principles, 1998. And in terms of fisheries, those have been transformed by the FAO ecosystem approach to fisheries uh, with the Garcia document in 2003. And then it has spread around all over the place, as you see at the top of the tree from South Africa, Australia, Canada. And in the European context, we have a HELCOM and OSPAS statement in 2003. There are quite a few NOAA statements, USA Oceans Policy. The Arctic Council has a definition and statement. The EU has made the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, and then Pisces and ICES also made statements on EBM and EBFM. There are so many definitions. And if I go to another meeting and I hear someone say, oh, we need a better definition of EBM or EBFM, I think I'm going to cry. Um, I also, as many of you will be aware, actually, I avoid the nuances of the difference between EBM, EA, F, uh, EBFM, I, I try to make sure that we head in a direction which is basically uh, along the lines of uh, sustainability, ecological development, that kind of thing. In ICES, we tried not to provide a definition when we produced the ICES statement on EBM and EBFM. We said we use key illustrative phrases instead, management of human activities, consideration of collective pressures, achievement of good environmental status, sustainable use, optimization of benefits among diverse societal goals, regionalization, which is a very important point, and I really would like to talk more about that, but I'm not going to, trade-offs and stewardship for future generations. And all of these can be read about and seen again in the FAO document by Serge, led by Serge Garcia, the CBD comments, Arctic Council, lost by Helcom, et cetera. And of course, the papers recently on the fisheries side by Long et al, which I think are very handy from the Canadian perspective. I'm going to begin with publicity for a new paper that Rob Stevenson and I think some people on this call have all contributed to, um, which is the Quilt of Sustainable Ocean Governance Patterns for Practitioners. And here we looked at social ecological systems, ecosystem approach, integrated management, maritime spatial planning, participatory co-management and the precautionary approach. And we looked at how all the authors judge the ecological, economic, social, cultural and institutional governance objectives in terms of those frameworks. And the narrative of the paper is all of these frameworks have differences, and as you can see in the diamond in the middle, uh, things like the ecosystem approach were felt to slant more to ecological objectives, whereas uh, social ecological systems were felt to slant more to social cultural objectives. And most of the ones that we studied actually were quite weak on economic objectives. I think that reflects the uh, the the areas of expertise of the authors. And then we put it all together and said, look, we're all on the same journey. And while we all may have different names, we're heading towards this uh, sustainable development. So I'm going to talk about the, briefly, a couple of slides on the conclusions of the work of the Aora project, which I worked on with many people like Jason Link, Alida, uh, Robin in Canada, and many, many others. And we, in the conclusions of the AORA project, which is the Atlantic Ocean Research Alliance, which was funded by DFO, also by NOAA, and by the European Commission. 
we said that EBM enables new benefits and opportunities, and we really need to make the business case, and the business case is strong. Yes, we can. There are adequate mandates and effective tools that exist for EBM. Integration of the human dimension is essential for EBM. We need to diversify the conversation. I'm going to come back to that, particularly on the issue of saliency. Stakeholders don't see their stake in EBM. We need to engage and target ocean literacy to professionals. And a sustainable future requires sustained investment in EBM. Commitment is key. So I mentioned the business case already, and this is published in a paper that we've written with Jason Link. And we say quite clearly that the business case for EBM is clear. Private and societal benefits do come from across ecosystem services accounting for diverse social values. We get with EBM reduced transaction costs of governance compared to business as usual, and there's more efficiency and lower costs. Increased predictability and management government occurs with EBM. And also EBM allows us to prioritize the objectives of maritime users and align them with societal objectives. And then in a paper flowing again from this Atlantic Ocean Research Alliance work by Murray Rudd et al, um, we list the challenges to implementing EBM. And these are generally on the governance side. We, we understand the science side quite well, so I'm sharing with you more on the governance side. Conflicting interpretations of laws and mandates. Administrative practices and routines include organization power dynamics across government departments and getting those to work together is tricky. There is an imbalance across sector. We know that the economic power of sectors often outweighs others, but if any of you have watched or the, the story developing in Europe with Brexit, you'll understand that sectors with little economic power can wield a lot of influence, such as the fishing industry. Challenges of stakeholder, it, there are challenges in terms of stakeholder involvement. Conceptualizing EBM is context specific, regional objectives and priorities and global frameworks need to be developed. And we think that there is a clash between regional objectives and priorities and the global frameworks overall. Perhaps clash is too strong, attention. Crises swamp longer term priorities. All of us have just experienced a crisis over the last year and a half or two years uh, that has certainly swamped all longer term priorities. And EBM requires operating across maritime boundaries, and many of us have experienced problems there. And finally, there is an absence of good practice to showcase the merits of EBM. So I'm now going to turn to the issues of credibility, legitimacy, and savings. These three attributes are really important to consider when operating at the boundary between science and policy. And I'm making the assumption from the very beginning that you cannot do EBFM or EBM without working at the boundary between science and policy. As I said at the very beginning, heavily influenced by Cash et al in 2002, which also gives a lot of details about the trade-offs that are required between credibility, legitimacy, and salience. And the Cash et al. paper, I think, mostly talks about boundary organizations. But Christine Rockman and others in 2015 turned it around to start talking about individuals and their roles in the processes associated with EBM and EBFM. And I'm going to use a little image to help illustrate to you what I mean by salience, legitimacy, and credibility. And I want you to imagine an orchestra. And this orchestra is credible because it uses the best available information, the best available science. As I've had, as we've put here, practice makes perfect. You find this orchestra credible, you know you're gonna get a good show from them because they work hard to produce the best available. And legitimacy. The authority to speak. I struggled with the phrase authority to speak, but I think it works okay here. But it's the thing viewed as a 
okay at the table, that you can join the party. And in the case of the orchestra, we know that they're award-winning. We know that they're critically acclaimed. They've been given five-star reviews and they are sold out. So on a whole range of different criteria, they are considered legitimate. So you're going to watch them play because they are a legitimate concern. Legitimate concern. And as for saliency, it's important to be relevant, not just to the people and the challenges you're working with, but also the process into which you're going. And here we have the orchestra is playing mostly to the audience sitting in the formal seats, but the jazz singer has decided that there's this whole jazzy crowd on the edge he wants to play to. And he's been relevant to that audience as well. But uh, close to them, you also see the process. And being salient is also about making sure that you deliver the music in the right way. And here we have the radio, the iPhone or mobile phone, and the gramophone to suit whichever audience is required. So this is what I'm going to explore further here, Cred credibility, legitimacy, salience. So credibility using best available. And I defined it roughly as the perception that information meets standards and scientific plausibility and technical adequacy. Some of these definitions are based on other people's definitions and I've sort of morphed them a bit. And in terms of the principles for EBM, the Malawi principles, but also the FAO guidance, I think what's quite clear here is that you need to consider all forms of relevant information, including scientific, indigenous, local knowledge, innovations and practices. And you need to recognize the potential gains from management. There is usually a need to understand and manage the ecosystem in an economic, social and cultural context. So from the principles of uh, CBD and from FAO guidance, I, I've taken those two as key illustrators. So the best available science and knowledge, ICES is contractually obliged to deliver all of its knowledge to the best available at the time. It's written into all our contracts with all of the people who ask us for requests. But it's not just about the knowledge itself, it's also about how that knowledge is created. And I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm not saying anything new here. We go from Gibbons with the Mode 2 science, we have Yasinov with the Post Normal, we go to Later, we've got Chris Sitanovich and commenting, and I'm going to talk you through this image below, and Singatau in 2021, and I'm going to pick a phrase from them uh, a little later. But this image is from Chris Sitanovich, seven strategies that can be used to manage challenges and risks of participatory adaption research. And this group has highlighted that we need to reimagine professional development, ensure the appropriate institutional support. As we work to produce best available, we need to monitor the team composition and choose the participants carefully. I'm getting a little frustrated by people's assumption that you can do great work without being more careful about who joins the team and why they join the team and how you all remain accountable and responsible in those roles. I might touch on that later, we'll see. We use, you use different modes of scientific inquiry and you need to set clear expectations and incorporate mechanisms for independent review. Another paper which there are many, many authors on came out, I think, in Nature, the principles for knowledge co-production and sustainability research. There are lots and lots of published papers on this, but this is the one that I felt showed best uh, what you should consider when looking at co-production. And I'm using co-production as an example of credible science. You need to be context-based, pluralistic, goal-oriented and interactive. And I think it speaks for itself. I'm not saying there is only one approach, but I'm saying that considering these four aspects would really help into how you develop your science. And then my next 
next piece or example is, of course, the work coming from your part of the world. I'm a great fan of Sarah Gaitches's work, and this is the Muffy et al. paper, which I think showed a wonderful example of credibility of using high quality science, working in partnership with the managers and the stakeholders, exploring the risks and prioritization for management actions. I think we spend a lot of time with reviews and with synthesis and looking at the scientific literature to make sure that our work in EBFM is credible. And I think it's what we as researchers do best out of these three attributes. But the scientific community has focused heavily on this credibility. And it's no real surprise that uh, we think about providing a good, strong evidence base. But many of you know I'm a great fan of Phil Levin. And I found his paper on the uh, Rashomon effects very inspirational. And it, they said, we must acknowledge epis, it's also a word I can't say, by the way, epistemic plurality, differences in perceptions and meanings and concepts across science. And then we have the paper by Moon et al that uh, itter, itter, I'm losing the ability to speak. Let me have some water. Integrative research is not just about integrated, oh, that's why I'm getting it wrong. Integrative research is not just about integrating different types of science, but also about integrating different epistemologies. So it's about the knowledge bases as well as the knowledge community. Okay, so let's turn to legitimacy, the authority to speak. And in fact, perhaps a better way of saying it is the authority to contribute. Making sure that the process is perceived as unbiased and meeting standards of political and procedural fairness. And looking at the CBD principles and the FAO guidance, I've chosen three here. Objectives of management of resources are a matter of societal choices. I'm going to really explore this issue a bit more. Involvement should include relevant sections, sectors of society and scientific disciplines, and appropriate policy, legal and institutional frameworks need to be adopted and actually it's best practice to make sure that they are designed well. There's a number of issues in terms of legitimacy that uh, I'd like to dwell on. Politics must not be allowed to obscure a scientific consensus, but equally the technical Technical complexities of science must not be allowed to obscure the political judgments that are ultimately at the heart of a regulatory decision. And I think this is key if we live in a democratic or liberal society. In the same way, though, the, uh, the paper by Lassen and Turnout quite recent said uh, something quite different. It was almost Accusatory blockage created by science institutions forces, sorry, by science institution forces are shielded from scrutiny and change through retreats behind the shields of neutrality and objectivity, stoked and legitimated by fears of losing scientific authority. So that's the other slant on legitimacy. Us scientists hiding behind our neutrality and objectivity, not being responsible for the outcomes of our decisions, our actions. And the final quote I have here, while perceived harm to, diversify, to diverse values and priorities, disputed facts and legal questions create conflict, informed and empowered public engagement prepares governments to forge socially legitimate and environmentally acceptable decisions. Integrity, transparency, and inclusiveness matter. And I think that's really key. 
integrity, transparency, and inclusiveness matter. And I noticed on Twitter today, integrity and US scientists were up in the headlines particularly with governments. I'd also like you to look, if you can, at uh, Mike Sissenwein's comment on Jake Rice's in 2007 and 2011, where they argue that if you provide evidence into EBFM or into fisheries science as a whole, you really shouldn't be an advocate, which is actually quite an interesting statement, considering I think both of them are fairly strong advocates. A paper which I'm surprised not more people haven't referred to is by Murray Rudd uh, in 2015, where he serves, surveys over 2,000 scientists active across the science for policy field. And there is a, a majority that disagree with the statement that scientific experts are advocates, and a majority that disagree that scientists have no responsibility. In other words, scientists have responsibility. And there's a majority that agree that there is always a struggle with values. The work by van der Haal and Biermann in 2017 put this another way. There are many types of knowledge provider. And I really like this setup because I think it shows that you need to make a choice. I disagree with Mike Sis and mine, if, if I interpreted his words right, that, or, and Jake as well, that you shouldn't be advocates in an EBFM situation. But I think you need to know what you're up to. You need to choose your role. And here, these two use the cash setup again of saliency, credibility, and legitimacy. And they talk about assessment-oriented, advice-oriented, and solution-oriented uh, providers of knowledge. And in terms of the legitimacy, they talk about legitimacy through representation, through formal recognition, and through participation. And I think those are ways and approaches that people need to think. And on top of that, I'd like to give two more uh, takes on this. I'm going back old school to the PICO work, uh, which I think is too aspirational in some ways, where he thinks about view of science in society and view of democracy and provides four main roles for scientists. Are you a pure scientist, an issues advocate, a science arbiter, or an honest broker of policy alternates? And I think what is problematic here is the notion of honest broker is aspirational as academic careers are based on funding and esteem. And there is a preference, really, I prefer to emphasize trust, integrity, and transparency rather than honest brokerage as such. And then if you go back to that Murray Rudd paper, he looks at the primacy of science, the primacy of to politics, and then converges and diverges. And he comes up with a, a, a set up, a number of types of knowledge providers into the science for policy arena. Uh, aspirational convergers, collaborative science communicators, survey yaysayers, advocates for science-based policy, disillusioned or skeptical scientists, and evidence providers. And Brown in 2008 said in his review of the PICOL work was, it's your job to choose your role. So now to saliency, salience. And my definition is relevance of information and delivery for an actor's decision choices and also for that system. And the principles, I think, which are best relevant to salience is management must recognize that change is inevitable, that it is undertaken at the appropriate scale and temporal scales, and that we seek the appropriate trade-offs between and integration of conservation and the use of marine resources. Roland Cormier um, wrote a paper actually through the AORA process where they looked at the science inputs 
into various activities for the policy making process. And he listed four, but I'm going to give you a fifth one. Science uh, gives into strategic goal setting, tactical objectives, management measures, and adaptive management. But in our European arena, scientists also play a huge role in terms of monitoring the ecosystem, but also progress towards achieving those goals and thresholds. I'm going to give you a, three quotes again. One classic pitfall is the identification of interesting and tractable questions within a scientific community that have little relevance outside of it, including no bearing on decision makers' real-world situation. This is from Cash, 2002. And then we've got, I haven't put this in italics because this is like a combined focus on process and not only scientific output, acknowledge decision makers' concerns, perspectives and values and involve other actors and make use of existing networks. And so this is a combination from Mitchell and Rockman. The reason I put it like this is I think uh, uh, Christina Rockman and friends um, embed Mitchell into that definition. And then we go to, to Fulton's comment, which is despite acknowledging growing pressure on marine systems and an ecosystem context, fisheries management and fisheries science persists with a focus on simple single species concepts such as MSY. This is because the following combination of accidents of history, path dependence and human psychology act to impede the implementation of EBFM. So in terms of salience, I'm now going to leave the literature and give you my experience because I work at the, the coalface of delivering science for managers, for policy developers. And my experience, I'm gonna be quite candid, that scientists give minimal effort to understand the governance system and how management decisions are made in marine management. There is often implicit assumptions about the institution, uh, something about the I words, institutional frameworks are made by researchers. Decision making is assumed to be rational and evidence based. We've learning more and more with populist politicians that is often emotion driven. Rather than evidence informed and often politically driven. So it's that distinction between rational and evidence-based and evidence-informed and politically driven. Researchers embed their impression of the functioning of the management or governance system into their tools and models, or even worse, and I have seen this a lot, they embed their impression of how they think it should work. Their vision of good governance is written into their tools and processes. And researchers give little attention to the impact of soft power, politics, influence, implicit objectives, and emotion. And I think of all of those, I'd like to, you to think more about the implicit objectives. I hear a lot of scientists say I want explicit objectives. And yet, our society, particularly on the social and economic objectives side in fisheries, it's often the implicit objectives which are really the most important. So saliency, again, I'm going to give you an example from Europe, the Baltic Sea. There are a plethora of decision support tools and the uh, No God et al paper of 2020 lists all of the decisions to sports tools that have been produced for the Baltic, yeah, I think in the last 10 years, I might be wrong there. Oh yeah, it says on the side, 20 years, um, to, from 2000 to 2020. And there are complaints that developers and hosts indicate that the decision support tools or tables are not applied to their full potential. And that's because I think they just fail to understand the nature of the arena, the governance arena, where these tools are delivered. They assume there is one place to make a decision. 
they assume that the decisions are rational, that there is no bartering. And the big bar chart in the middle of this slide shows you the recent assessment of the state of the Baltic. Green is good, red is not good. And you can see eutrophication, completely red. Hazardous substances, very red. Indigenous species, very, very, very red. Commercial fishing, ah, we have three green circles and then a lot of red ones on top of that. And yet this is an environment with strong research, with a well-resourced funding organization for cross-Baltic research, and also a huge community of extremely good scientists, all pushing ahead, and yet we're still in a bad state, and we still have over uh, tables and tables of decision support tables. And then we go to social ecological systems. And I really appreciate and value all of the hard work that goes into viewing the world in this manner. Knowledge flows into which part of the system, though, is my question. You can question me about this afterwards, but I never see governance in these slides. And in the recent book in which I took this, uh, this figure from Hei Yan Piet, the governance section, there's almost no linkages to the other parts of the works, which was on ecological and social systems or the combination of social and ecological systems. So I really don't understand why people think we can make progress without understanding the arena to which we produce the evidence. And I, working with Aora, this is back to Murray Rudd's paper. We, in the Atlantic Ocean Research Alliance, we worked quite hard with lawyers and with experts in governance to put together a map of the system that creates political action in the West. And I'd like to highlight that the box on the, the column of three boxes on the left is what we got together to do in the workshop. These were the mandates, the legislation, the regulations, the hard stuff, the concrete stuff. And the governance experts at the workshop said to us, no, you're missing a whole point here. You're missing something. And if you follow down from soft customary law, they said these issues, the policy, the non-regulatory tools, tools, the patterns of ocean use which are affected by those, these are all soft and you cannot think about only the mandates if you don't think about the soft. And that was an education for me. And then we go to this wonderful paper by Beth Fulton, which looks at how we as fisheries scientists are held back by a number of issues. I already took a quote from that paper. And this figure here works wonderfully in terms of a psychological exploration of the trade-offs. What stops us taking one trade-off over another? We might realize that there are losses. We might realize that there's high uncertainty or ambiguity. And we might think that there's too many secular versus taboo values. This does result in bias, and our response is often quite different depending on what's, uh, what the issue is. And the outcome is the most important bit here, negative emotions and inaction for the realizing of losses. For the uncertainty and ambiguity, we feel deceived and again, inaction. And for the secular versus taboo, we come down to outcome compensation offer can backfire. And this is also, this isn't new. When I read the, the Singh et al paper, I think Eddie Allison's also co-author, etc. But I felt they just summed it up. Science does not inherently lead to sustainable or unsustainable or equitable or inequitable outcomes. The outcomes will depend on how, where, when, and by whom the science is designed, funded, conducted, and used. So, as I said, I said nothing new, 
except perhaps by one slide on uh, saliency. But my wrap up is we have a lot to go on already. We have the mandates, we have the principles, we have the understanding, we have the build it business case. In terms of credibility, the nature, the expectations of best available science is changing and will continue to change. In terms of legitimacy, we need to consider our role in the system and what gives us, you, the, your authority, ooh, spelling mistake, the authority to contribute. And in terms of salience, consider the decision-making arena and processes. Treat your assumptions about the governance and decision-making with as much care as you do your assumptions about ecosystem dynamics or economic trends. I think I would like that to be my take-home message, actually, to treat your assumptions in governance and decision-making with as much care as you do about ecosystem dynamics. And I'd invite you all to check out the ICES framework and principles, which is our attempt to address some of these issues. And you will have noticed, I haven't mentioned during this talk, any of the T's, trust and transparency. There's a lot more to say on trust and transparency. And of course, all of these are linked to the issues of integrity as of us as scientists and knowledge providers. So I hope I've given you a little, little sort of wander through the world of credibility, legitimacy, and salience. As I said, I've stolen heavily from Cash et al. 2002, and I hope you found it useful. And Peg asked me to stick this up, so here you go. This is uh, my, ah, my contact information. Or you can just Google me. Every Dickie Collis you will find on Google knows me because it's either a sibling of mine or someone married to a sibling of mine. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, if you have a question, please place that in the question panel. Um, Shall I Mark, stop sharing? Yes. Okay. If, if you don't want to have your last slide up, Mark, please, uh, you can stop sharing. Okay, I'll put that back up. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, so if you have a question, please place that in the question panel. And while everyone is uh, furiously typing, I assume, Peg, do you have any uh, questions or anything you'd like to say? I don't have a question, but I just really want to highlight Mark's observations and insights. Uh, very, very intriguing uh, description of the challenges we have and the and the progress we've made to date in the areas where we need to focus as, as a group with in terms of advancing EBM. But I really want to thank Mark for his insights and uh, observations. And um, I'm, we'll leave it open if there's any questions out there. I know there are a number of folks uh, that have been acknowledged by Mark in the presentation in uh, online. So please feel free to ask a question. It's your opportunity. Uh, we don't currently have a question, but there were a few questions about this being recorded. And I will repeat what I said earlier. This this was recorded. This is being recorded. And it will be up on the library's YouTube channel where you can find all of the past uh, EBM, EBFM seminars. Uh, I put that in the chat there for everyone. If there are no questions, we can wrap up early and give everyone some time, but it looks like we do have a question. Yeah, from Michael. Yes, uh, from Michael. So our first question is, how do we reconcile the differences between experiential knowledge and empirical knowledge? Oh my goodness. Um, well, you... To start, I'm not a specialist in that, so I I don't know. But what I do think you do is you recognize that both have value coming through. Um, I touched on it briefly in terms of the best available. I think that you really need to, let me rephrase this. All right, the one experience, no, I have many experiences of this, but we in ICs are trying to develop an ecosystem-based uh, framework 
And we have had discussions about whether our goal is to make everything quantitative. And we have come to the conclusion that that is not an appropriate goal to have everything quantitative. It's important to have value in the qualitative as well. And that leads me back to my experiences with IMBA, where we were struggling with coping with values and with trying to work with a geochemical community of modelers. How do they learn to use that empirical, uh, sorry, the experience, the values, the narratives? I prefer talking about narratives in that situation. And we haven't come up with any answers yet. And in fact, I'm going to have another meeting, I think, with IMBA, although I've left the Science Steering Committee in a few weeks to discuss the issue a bit more. So I'm going to give you a non-answer because I don't think there are answers there. And I'm sure there are, of these over 100 people listening, there will be somebody who could answer it better than me. Thanks so much, Mark. We do have a few more questions coming in. Uh, so our next question is, hi, Mark, you are asking a lot of scientists, have you had much response to these suggestions? I'm asking a lot about scientists. I don't think I am asking a lot about scientists. All I'm asking is think about your role, think about your integrity, and if you want to be applied, just be applied in a way that you feel you are keeping your integrity going. And I've offered one route. I did say choose whether you what kind of uh, what kind of legitimacy you want in the position. I have to make really clear my talk today was very much from a an international fisheries perspective. And I know that lots of community based EBFM projects work in a different way. And there still is credibility, salience and legitimacy. But what I have delivered to you here is in many ways a, a view from my slant of the world. So I don't think I've asked a lot to maintain your own integrity and to choose your role, but I do think you need, if you're going to, all right, I'll take a step back. If you are going to say that you are producing tools for people to use, please think long and hard about where those tools are going. Great, thank you. Our next question. Uh, what, in your view, establishes credibility in science from a manager's perspective? Ooh, that's an interesting question. Um, from a scientist perspective, of course, it's publications, peer review, and everybody loves you, and then you get tenure, yeah. Um, but from a manager's perspective, I think it comes down to the T word I didn't talk about, which is trust. And I think you need to use, you will only be viewed credible if you have managed to bring about the trust in your work and you as a person. And I think credibility, actually, I'm gonna slightly disagree with myself and go back to this slide, where are we? This one here. And I think there's a number of issues in terms of the credentials and also through community, which I think are very important in terms of the manager's eyes. Yeah, I'll leave it there. Is that good enough? Oh, you can't answer me, so that's great. <laughs> if they wanna leave a comment afterwards, they are welcome to. Our next question, um, hi Mark, could you elaborate on your remark at the beginning of the presentation regarding carefully choosing participants? You said that you might talk about it at the end, thank you. Yeah, um, I have, uh, I'm initiating, or the advisory committee in ICES and the science committee in ICES are initiating a review of stakeholder engagement in ICES and we have, had a number of initiatives which have opened many of our processes to stakeholders. Some of those processes haven't gone so well and we're trying to explore why. And I think it's because we've been naive and completely unguarded in our opening up process. 
and we need to make sure that good stakeholder engagement practice is brought into ICES. And we haven't done that, we've just opened the doors. And so in terms of the participants, I think it's very important that we develop some boundaries somewhere. And it's very unfashionable to say that, but those boundaries I think are necessary to ensure the credibility, legitimacy and safety of the process. In the same way, we also have opened the doors greatly to managers and the managers have full access to any part of the process that they are paying for basically. And this is also causing some challenges in terms of the independence of ICs, in terms of our, our credibility as providers of best available science. And so I think ICs, I'm using us as an example, have been naive and we need to think about boundaries and we need to think about selections of participants um, and move that forward. Thanks, Mark. Okay, our next question. Does this approach view governance uh, slash policy as part of the human dimensions we keep trying to include in EBM, or is it in addition to the addition of social sciences? Oh, well, of course, everybody would say that by creating the one bucket social sciences, is, we, uh, we're completely as natural scientists ignoring the complexity of what goes on there as well. Um, I, I think it is one of the social sciences. Uh, I think there is a difference though between studying governance and operating in governance. The two are complementary and one helps the other, but I do think it's quite important to make the distinction of learning about the system in which your tool is going and going to be used and actually studying the overall processes of governance. I think those are two quite distinctly different things. Thank you. Okay, our next question. Um, if we want to move away from quantification, what measures will we use when it comes time to to make trade-offs? I'm not saying move away from quantification. I'm saying move, uh, become more inclusive. Uh, we, I've already mentioned that there were uh, people requesting a different move away into, sorry, requesting that we consider the plurality of knowledge, um, that we think about other types of knowledge. And I think it's about greater inclusion of those other types of knowledge, not moving away from quantification. Could you repeat that question again? Because I was just trying to redefine it rather than answer it. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, the question was, if we want to move away from quantification, what measures will we use when it comes time to make trade-offs? Well, I know that Mike Rust is talking next time on this and Mike and some others working in the agriculture world are building up risk assessments that are uh, qualified rather than quantified. So there are approaches out there. I'm not an expert in this, um, but certainly there are a number of people that are operating in the ISIS science community that are pushing quite hard that in terms of finding trade-offs associated with risk, um, there are quant me methods for finding quali well, narratives and non-quantified solutions. Thanks, Mark. Our next I'm, getting, I'm getting tongue-tied, by the way. <laughs> That's all right. We have a few more questions uh, before the end of the hour. Uh, to what extent do you think the role of the scientists is impacted by the number of countries with seats at the top decision-making table? Does management inertia and scientific conservationism increase with the number of state actors involved? Oh, what a question. Um, I don't think the number matters. I think the, the nature of the groupings matters um, and the power dynamics within the actors. And it doesn't have to be countries. It can be any consensus building situ situation. 
I would like to say that in terms of inertia, I think there are some problems with being too close or too embedded in the system. I can't remember, I was reading a paper recently about uh, insider advisors. And to some extent, ICES is an insider advisor. And the paper claimed that insider advisors couldn't reform as well as an outsider advisor. And that's a very interesting challenge, particularly for ICES um, who need to reform, are very path dependent, have incredibly institutionalized uh, frameworks for dealing with things because we are required to be very consistent and quality assured in terms of our advice. And yet, do we have the ability to reform? And I think Beth's paper works quite well in terms of the reasons and trying to explain why reforming is so difficult. But I think an insider advisor is very difficult there. I think I've wondered from the question, but that's what I'm giving you. No, that's great. Thank you, Mark. Okay, I'm going to try and grab two more questions. Uh, the next one is, you mentioned management must recognize that change is inevitable, yet there is understandable reluctance to changing management practices. Climate change may accelerate the need to change. Any thoughts on how science and management can work to find the change sweet spot? Well, it is one of the core principles, isn't it? The Malawi principle that change is inevitable. Um, we've just had 18 months, which have shown us that change can happen instantly. All of us have been hugely impacted by a, a sudden change, which has had dramatic effects throughout the entire system. So change can occur at very high levels and ramifications for the entire system can be quite fantastic and also quite scary. I know that there's a huge number of governance experts, academics who are studying the response to COVID as, a, as one of the most incredible test cases going. So the sweet spot, the sweet spot for change, um, I think is so region or context specific that I don't think we can actually set down clear guidance or it, every single experience is different, I think. Um, but I would recommend you read Beth's recent paper on reform and uh, rationale and path dependency. Thanks, Mark. I'm going to grab this one last question. Um, thank you, Mark, for this amazing talk. I love Cash at All 2002. So this really spoke to me. You mentioned the co-production of knowledge slash decisions. Is there a way to incentivize scientists to do this other than that it's right? Well, it's not always right. And there are some degrees at which um, co-production, co-design, et cetera, are wrong or they get it wrong. I think Paul Carney in his book on uh, uh, evidence-based policy making um, says quite clearly that there are a number of times when co-production or co-knowledge, it, it isn't a panacea, it can go wrong. But the benefits are clear. And I think the, the business case slide that I gave actually gives a number of things that, that I attributed to EBM and EBFM, but actually um, I think are also valid for co-production or co-design that uh, there's reduced transaction costs to governance compared to business as usual. That's, that's quite clear. I think also in terms of um, framing the challenges and the, and the problems, I mean, there's, there's quite a number, there's a, a beautiful star um, on decision-making and co-production in a paper that I have now forgotten, um, which actually lists about six benefits of co-production, co-design which uh, I, I could easily show at, in another talk. Thanks so much, Mark. We are right up against the hour. I do have about four questions that I'm not able to get to, so we will send those along to you to answer offline. Thank you all so much for attending today. Uh, Peg, do you want to remind them of the next speaker? 
Yes, yeah, so again, uh, thank you again, Mark. This was really insightful and very helpful for a lot of the thinking we're doing uh, within our own <laughs> world here in the, in the US. So thanks again, and, and thanks for taking you know, this extra time in your day <laughs> in the evening over there. I appreciate that. Next one is June 9th, Mike Rust. We'll be speaking about EBM and aquaculture here in the US. And uh, again, same time, same place. Um, and thanks again, Katie, for the library support. Appreciate everyone's attendance. Thank you. Thank you all and have a wonderful rest of your day.